Good morning, everybody. My name is Jennifer Jones. I am a business liaison with K64. We're having some technical difficulty getting uh, Keith's site where you can hear him. So I wanted to just welcome everybody on behalf of Catawba Valley Community College, K64, and the Chamber of Catawba County. Um, this is the first of several leader talks that are designed to help community business leaders provide support and assistance during the battle with COVID-19. Um, and we've got uh, Dr. Keith Mackey, who is a uh, uh, CV, one of CVCC's vice presidents here to welcome you all this morning. Good morning. Uh, I am the executive vice president at Catawba Valley Community College, and I'd like to welcome you to CVCC Leader Talk series. Uh, we're so pleased that you're able to join us, even if it is by virtual means. Our first leader talk, Leading Through Troubled Waters, addresses how to cope with the mental stress for employees faced with issues such as unemployment, furlough, child care, health care, and so forth. The list goes on. It seems that new questions and situations arise each day, and the questions are often ones that we've not had to deal with before, that we are in uncharted waters. So today our goal is to bring you information that will help you as you navigate through those uncharted and sometimes troubled waters. Communication, coping strategies, staying connected, and providing helpful resources and information for your employees, topics that we'll discuss today are maybe more important than ever given the pandemic. On behalf of our president, Dr. Garrett Henshaw, and our faculty and staff, I welcome you and wish you and your families our very best. This is a challenging time for our community, and we appreciate everything that you're doing to keep our community healthy and strong. We are fortunate this morning to have two outstanding speakers with us, Dr. Gary Endenbaum and Mr. Brian S. Hissom. Dr. Endenbaum has been practicing psychology since 1972. He graduated with his PhD from the American University. Dr. Endenbaum is a past president of the North Carolina Psychological Association's Division of Independent Professional Practice. He is a licensed psychologist and health services provider in North Carolina, as well as having been listed in the National Register of Health Services Providers in Psychology. Mr. Brian Hissom holds Bachelor and Master's of Arts degrees in Counseling from Marshall University. Mr. Hissom is a certified rational emotive therapist trained by the Institute for Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. He is licensed professional counselor and specializes in working with adolescents and adults who have emotional, behavioral, and relationship difficulties. Together, Dr. Endenbaum and Mr. Hissom founded Employee Assistance Resources and Employee Assistance Program Business, established in Hickory in 2002. So welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for agreeing to speak with us today. And again, to all of our attendees today, please stay safe, healthy, and strong, and we will get this together. Gentlemen, the virtual floor is yours. Again, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. And before you guys start, if I could just let you know, if you have questions as we go throughout the event today, if you'll type those in the question and answer box at the end, I will read those off and, and uh, the good doctors will share answers for us. Okay, I guess that means I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for having us. And um, again, as reflecting Dr. Mackey's comments, my best wishes to everybody. Hang in there, take care of yourselves, take care of your families. Um, Brian and I have some suggestions and ideas about things that we will help you in a couple of different ways. But first, I just want to acknowledge these are indeed very troubled times. And the troubled times because this kind of calamity that we're facing is different than the, if you'll pardon the expression, usual calamities. You now, we have struggled through hurricanes and tornadoes and other kinds of natural catastrophes. We've even had uh, in our country, uh, bombings and terrorist events, all of those things usually are extremely acute. They have a, a defined presence. They have a, even though there can be extended recovery times emotionally and physically, we should sort of have a clarity that it's over and now we're working towards some kind of solution. This is different. It's unseen. 
is something that we don't have a clear understanding of how long it's going to last. It's an ongoing risk. We stay hypervigilant. We, uh, we don't know exactly whether or not we're a risk to other people or not. This is just a different kettle of fish for all of us. And as a result, we tend to stay in this constant state of looking at the news and trying to wonder what the best thing is to do. The stress can be exhausting. And our job today is to try to see if we can give you some ideas of how to manage this better. We're gonna talk in about three main things. One, Brian and I are gonna initially discuss the issues of how do employers pay attention the best they can for their employees. Then we wanna spend some time talking about how leaders and employers and people in positions of authority and management, how they need to take care of themselves. And then at the end, we've got some general comments about just for everybody, things to do to manage stress and anxiety as best we can under the circumstances. Um, Brian's gonna start by talking about, I guess, the core issue when you're trying to be helpful to other people, when you're trying to be there for them, the most critical issue is how we communicate. And I'll let Brian go with that for a bit. Gary, and uh, thank you all for participating and um, going an extra step to try to find out how as, as business leaders, um, you can uh, enhance the way you're, you're managing this with your employees. As Gary said, the communication is hugely important and folks are in a, in a rolling, um, a rolling event, so to speak, as opposed to a point in time event. People are looking for information all the time. And we see that uh, illustrated in the, you know, the, the use of social media to get information. And believe it or not, apparently fa Facebook is not always the best source of, of news and information. Um, and as an employer, you are in a unique position not to interpret the news for folks, but to provide folks with information that can be useful for them with, with regard to what they're doing for you and with you. So some years ago, uh, Gary and I developed um, a, 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 a quick collection of, of terms or reminders about communication that we call the four keys to effective communication. So when you're, when you're in a, a situation, whether you're speaking to a group or individuals, four things to remember, which, you know, this may seem elementary, but keep it in mind, four ways to approach communication with employees individually or with, with groups is to always use respect and patience, honesty, validation, and, and, and empowerment uh, with, with your folks. So let's, let's start with respect and patience. So what, what does that mean and what does that look like? One of the hardest things to do when we as, as leaders have a lot to say, and we know that what we have to share is gonna be useful and helpful, one of the more difficult things for us to do first is to just listen. And listening to the concerns that folks have is so very important uh, because by doing that, you're showing your care and your concern, you're building empathy, you're setting the stage so that what you have to share can be best uh, received and used by folks. A, a way to think about this is to listen without thinking so that you're showing attentiveness while you're listening. Think about um, the complaint we have um, where, where we're trying to, to, to read something or watch television and somebody in our family is trying to talk with us at the same time. It doesn't often very, work very well because we can't pay attention to two bits of information, two streams of information very well. So um, when you're listening with somebody, uh, if you're able to do that without the internal chatter going on where you're thinking about what they're saying, that can often kind of open up the channel of communication so that you're really hearing and seeing what they're experiencing. So listening without thinking is a good first step. When you respond, when you, when you speak with folks, of course, use honesty. And what that means is to, to just never lie. And sometimes out of our attempt to be helpful and to be encouraging and supportive and soothing, we'll say things that we, we just can't follow up with. For example, if I'm talking with an employee and I tell them, you know, this is gonna be just fine, call me anytime and I'll do everything I can to be helpful. That may be a, a sentiment we want to communicate, but in practice, the question is, can we really do anything all the time? And, and the answer is no. So being timely and consistent with what you have to share, providing um, overly uh, supportive statements that we can't fulfill is very important. Validating the concerns that folks have is also very important. 
this is, I think, part of the reason folks are going to social media and other platforms to, to, to gain information. Part of it is to validate what their concerns are. And as an employer, I think we're in a, in a particularly good position um, to help folks walk through that information while listening well to their emotional concerns and letting them know that what they're experiencing is very normal. We also can call it normalization um, by being patient with listening um, to the concerns that folks have and providing them with good solid information from your standpoint as an employer, um, then you're, you're moving them toward the step of being able to feel empowered. The more we know about a situation, the better decisions we can make. And we provide folks with useful, valid information. They feel respected and that helps those employees to then make good decisions as far as how they're going to manage the impact that this will have on them, whether it's shifting uh, in their job due to a work pool situation, whether it's unfortunately being furloughed or having hours reduced, or whether it's, it's working in a different way because of social distancing being, um, being put in place in their, in their environment at work. So our four keys to communication, uh, respect and patience, honesty, validation, and empowerment that hopefully helps you set the stage to, to be as supportive and helpful as possible decreasing their stress and giving them tools to decrease their stress in response to this kind of rolling crisis that we find ourselves in. I, I think I just want to uh, underscore what Brian's saying in that I suspect most everyone who's listening to this kind of knows that those are really critical in your relationships with people. But at times like this, when we ourselves are all stressed out and you're worried and you're preoccupied, it's easy to forget those things. It's easy to be more impatient, to be a little less tolerant, to be a little less willing to take the time to really listen. And all we're doing is reminding you how critical that is. The other piece that I, I wanna to talk to about now is that when you're dealing with employees, it's critical to remain, even though you, you've got a job to do and you've got things you wanna get accomplished, let's not forget what everybody's going through. It's sort of heightening our level, level of empathy. Even while there are uh, financial issues and business decisions to be made, let's not forget that every one of those people who is, who is an employee is struggling in one way or another. Everybody is dealing with some sense of grief and loss. Turn on a television set. We have tens of thousands of people who are dying. We have people who are sick. And all of us, those of us who are paying attention, even if it hasn't touched us personally, we feel it. We, we have concerns about it. We have not just loss because of people who've died or people who are sick, but a loss of a way of life for right now, a loss for a sense of security. Everyone is struggling with that. We're not sure about what our job's gonna be long-term. Many people have financial issues going on that are difficult for them. Um, we can be angry, it may not be rational, but we're angry about why did this have to happen now? Why is this happening to me? Why isn't someone fixing this? Why can't they make it better? Again, that may not be rational, but it's the kind of experience emotionally that people are going through. As a result of that, even employees who are back on the job, it's hard for them to focus. You have to understand people are gonna be more distractible. They may not be quite as productive. Your ability to have sense of understanding about that, a little more tolerance, will go a long way towards helping. And what people need because of what they're experiencing is they're gonna need a lot more support and a lot more information. Brian, can you speak to that a little bit more? Sure. Increasing communication frequency and ways of communicating can be really, really important. I know of a lot of employers that have opened up Facebook pages, um, special uh, access portals uh, for employees, on their web page to provide information. Um, and that's, that's very, very useful. Um, email uh, newsletters that can used to go out monthly can now go out daily or weekly or, or twice weekly to provide folks with information on what's happening. Another part of that though, is to have a, to have a, um, a handle, have a feel for what's going on with, within the employee core. Um, one way to do that is by, by managing, by wandering around, uh, being present, as leaders, uh, making sure that your supervisors are also very present with their, their staff and know what symptoms to look for. Uh, and it's very important to know um, 
what you might see that could identify employees who are having a particularly difficult struggle. So, for example, employees who um, um, is something that you would you would always look at as a potential sign of an employee who's having difficulty. But in this situation, we might also say, so say excuse me might also see increased levels of anger and frustration, as Gary mentioned. We might see more conflict um, with other employees. Uh, folks may also just seem distracted. Um, there's a phrase of having a thousand folks are deeply troubled. They may be doing their job, kind of going through the motions, but supervisors don't as usual. Um, other things we might see of employees and even of ourselves would be a sense of being hypervigilant, where we're kind of on guard for, for, for the next threat. Uh, folks may seem more jumpy, make more errors. So this is kind of the environment we may be looking at. Um, but it can also be important then to help shift them back to what's important now, the inaccurate win, W-I-N. So give that a thought for a moment. Um, it can be very reassuring to be at work and, and have uh, our mind and body focused on something that we do well and enjoy doing in a way that it can sort of force or, or move those other worries out of the forefront of our thinking. So what's important now? Uh, can be staying focused on the here and now, and whether that's making a product or or, or working with sales or you know providing healthcare, um, staying focused on that can actually be quite relaxing and anxiety relieving because it's a it's a bit of normalcy. A big part um, of this process is to help folks develop a new normal. Um, so, where does this communication? piece fit in, it, it fits in by helping them decrease their anxiety by having good solid information and having a sense of normalcy at work. You're removing barriers to their ability to focus at work by helping them with, with good solid information and also providing personal support. Um, employers have found ways, and I think it's phenomenal, to, to provide food on the job so that that's one less thing that they have to think about and prepare for while at home. So having uh, food and other support in place, uh, conveniences that can be delivered and provided at work are important. For, for employers that have food service on site, cafeterias, canteens, and so on, uh, I've actually seen one employer who are setting up a bit of a commissary so employees can purchase staples at work um, before they go home to decrease that level of stress um, before they head out and, and um, go to deal with the stress of managing their, their family situation. And finally, another piece of information they should have is quick and easy access to mental health support that they could find through their employee assistance program uh, or their health insurance. So making sure that your EAP and health insurance information is being um, easily available, provided frequently in ways that folks can access that privately and confidentially is really, really important. We also then, you know, we're talking here about the employees who are coming and going in, in our facilities, which is likely to be a small, small percentage of, of who's working with us and for us now, because we do have so many folks who are working from home. So we have a different challenge, and that is providing folks support who are now, you know, miles away and in different buildings, um, and also who are adjusting to doing their work in a brand new environment and in a brand new schedule. Let me speak to that a bit more. Um, I, I can tell you that there are many of you who are listening in. You do this all the time. You sit at home, you're sitting in front of your computer, you've got your headphones on, and you're getting your work done. I have a son who does that in South Carolina. He's got three computer screens in front of him, and he's multitasking and talking to people and scheduling meetings. And for him, this is another day at the office. I can tell you, for me, it's not. And for a lot of people, this is new. Um, it's nice to be able to do this, and I've been doing it with family and other people, but there's a certain amount of technological curve that isn't always easy. And there's a certain amount of self-discipline and a change in how you manage your life that's really important. So for those people who are now newly remote workers, I have a few just simple suggestions that you probably know, but I want to reinforce them because they're important. Number one is minimize your distractions. It's very important that you find a place 
that is separate from the ebb and flow of your normal household. It's a place that is free of distractibility as much as possible. Don't have the news on in the background. Make sure the kids can't come running through the door. You have to have a place that belongs to you strictly for this. And make sure, again, you make it a news-free zone. Don't have the news going on in the background. Keep your focus on your job when that's what you're supposed to be doing. The second thing is set some very specific time-limited and performance-related goals and expectations. So sit down at the beginning of the day and say, I want to accomplish A, B, and C between 9 and 1030. And a nice way to do that is let some people know that you've set those goals. It could be a colleague. It could be even a family member. But let someone know at the end of that time, you're going to check in with somebody or more, make sure that you're, there's some sort of degree of accountability. And if you do that throughout the, the day and structure your time, it'll help you be more productive and not get, get pulled away. There is a lot of research that says that people who work from home, if you're remote, they tend to log more hours on the job. And it's because they're not focused on the job. They've got too many other things at home pulling them away. Oh, yeah, remember, I think I'll take a few minutes and work on that project in the, in, in the basement. This is not a good idea. Keep your focus on what you're doing. Make a communication plan. Make sure during the day you are going to touch base with your supervisor, with your uh, people's supervisees, with customers. Set it up on a scheduled basis. It'll help you be more productive and make sure that the important things are getting taken care of. And make sure you're maintaining your social connections with these various people too, because it makes things go more smoothly. Um, now, Brian's going to talk a little bit more about some suggestions for leaders in terms that they can do to maximize and improve their relationships with the people they're working with and manage their stress levels. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, you know, it's often said that that if uh, if we don't take care of ourselves, we we can't take care of anybody else, and so that is. Uh, that is so true in this situation. Um, so the, the question we have for one another here is what are we doing to manage our stress? So Gary's uh, remote work at home uh, tips is a good place to start. Another item is, is to have a schedule that um, have a routine outside of your work schedule. I've, I've talked to some folks who are teaching from home or providing therapy from home what's happening is they're feeling tired partially because of the emotional stress of all this but another thing that they're doing is letting their bedtime and their meal times kind of slide around in the daily schedule and unfortunately you know that contributes to to the, the stress of this situation so being consistent with uh, bedtime meal time uh, wake up time and exercise time is very very important um, so taking good care of yourself point. Now, one of the things that our bodies do uh, in a stress response is there's a part of our brain that does that, that engages something we call the fight or flight response, and that's protective. And um, that's a great thing whenever we're in acute danger. But as we've said from the very beginning, this is not a point in time event. This is a rolling crisis. And so the, the, the sense of danger can be there all the time. But what will happen is we become fatigued from that process. And so being able to, to stop that periodically through the day or at least minimize it is very important. So using meditation, diaphragmatic breathing, um, taking a five minute break to, to let your brain and body just slow down with some intentional diaphragmatic breathing can help you manage that anxiety yourself as you work towards sharing information with your staff. Uh, as you approach them and set a good example, being a good role model of a person who's seen as, as managing through this uh, openly and in a relaxed way. You have long histories with a lot of employees, with a lot of staff. You've got credibility there, and we can, we can see using that uh, credibility and history to, to build on the trust that you have by doing what you say. Um, early in the four keys, we talked a bit about listening without speaking. There's also the, the concept of nonverbal communication, and that is that, that folks will interpret uh, our message based more so on how we look, uh, our tone of voice, our nonverbal bits of communication than our verbal. So having that congruence when we're delivering messages um, helps to maximize trust. Being honest and transparent, provide regular communication, um, and, and developing a form for feedback. Um, 
having a, a, an open way for folks to to bring their fears and concerns um, to the leaders in the company is 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 a great way to to develop a forum. But as Gary was saying earlier, having that structured so that there's a place and time for that, unless it's a crisis or an urgent situation, um, can help to decrease everybody's stress. If we know that at 10 o'clock we're giving a, a status update at a certain time, 10 o'clock, for example, that can help to decrease the stress from, from having, that, um, having that, that lingering set of questions there all the time with, without answers. So to kind of summarize, managing your stress, um, exercise, diet, um, scheduled activity, relaxation skills, meditation, building on your credibility and, and, and trust you have with your employees by honest and transparent communication, and frequent feedback, frequent regular communication about the status of the company and the status of, uh, of their, uh, their position can be very, very helpful. Um, looking at, at specific coping strategies next, um, we wanted to speak a bit about the importance of having mental health support for your employees. And Gary was gonna review how that could look with an employee assistance program. Well, I, I think most of you have some familiar with the APs, and I, I really don't want to spend too much time on that. We are looking at the clock, and I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I guess it's just reinforcing the notion as many resources that can be brought to bear for employees to get help with mental health issues is has great value. Remember, you're dealing with some people who are remarkably resilient, who can handle a lot of stuff and keep on plugging, but there are also people out there in our personal lives as well as in our in our business in our business situations people who are more vulnerable and more fragile and in circumstances like this they're much more likely to have difficulty and being able to direct them towards resources where they can get help whether that's an eap or a licensed mental health professional i think uh, employers are often in a great position to point people in the right direction with the time we have left and i will have to go fairly quickly i want to run through some general kinds of strategies to help everybody who's dealing with a situation that's difficult like this. I love this, there's a little way of thinking about that. And it says, if you can name it, you can tame it. And what they're saying is, don't be, any, any, many of you may be familiar with Harry Potter. In Harry Potter, there is a real bad guy. Um, and you're not supposed to ever say his name. Do you remember that? Voldemort. And they always say, he who shall not be named or you know the person who we can't mention who that is in this case we know what this problem is it's COVID-19 it's a coronavirus and it causes serious problems in our lives and what you need to be able to do is to be able to sit down and say okay this is the problem but what am I actually worried about and sit down and really and I strongly recommend if you're anxious about this get out a pencil and paper sit at your computer write down the specific things that you're frightened of that are making you anxious what if I get sick? What if my family gets sick? What if this goes so on so long that I'm gonna really get crunched financially? What if I don't have enough toilet paper? I can't imagine that'd be a problem for anybody. That is the strangest things going through the grocery stores, isn't it? That's so weird. What if I don't have enough chocolate? Oh my God. Okay, sit down and write these things down. Write out your list and then sit down and ask yourself realistically, what is the likelihood that this is really gonna occur? For example, if you look at it, if you are doing all the right stuff, if you are maintaining physical distance, if you're washing your hands all the time, if you're not having contact with people who might be possibly carrying the virus, the chances are actually very, very small. That's not a highly probable thing, but you need to think about it in a realistic way. Then you need to ask yourself, well, if I actually had a problem, how much of an impact is it gonna have on me? What if I do run out of a certain item? Is that gonna be a catastrophe? or is it gonna be an inconvenience for a while? Write the list down and then ask yourself two questions. What can I control and what can't I control? Very important questions. Remember the serenity prayer? God grant me the serenity, to, the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Think that through. If you can control something, then let's figure out what you can do about it. If you can't, then let's figure out how to manage what we can't control. In the case where you can control something, make a plan. Sit down and say, okay, if this happens, what am I gonna do about it? 
thinking things through when you're calmer and more rational, you're more likely to make a better decision and you'll feel a little bit more in control. Write the list out and if you make up a plan for the things that you can actually do something about. If you're worried about, oh, what am I going to do with the kids? They're home all the time. Okay, let's come up with a plan. What's the schedule going to be? What are the activities? How much am I going to have screen time? How much am I going to set up certain game time kinds of things? But be creative, have a plan. It makes all the difference in the world. The other thing is if you can't change something, there's things you can do about that too. And Brian mentioned them already. Get some exercise. Practice some mediation or mindfulness. If that's hard for you, I've got a great book for you. Try, um, there's a book called uh, Mindfulness for the Fidgety Skeptic. For those of you who've never tried it, that's a good one. Um, you can try books, games. You can try something. I actually put together a Lego project. I'm very proud of that. Okay. But it, I like to say, don't just sit there and worry. Do something. I think that's critical. Um, Brian, some thoughts? Yeah, another thing that I think can be helpful with, with accepting what you can't change or, or, or coming up with a plan is to think about, think about the worst case scenario. And, I, and I'm, you know, let's say that a, an employee is, is looking at, at having their hours reduced significantly. Um, instead of being stuck in that anxiety, the, the, the functional question is, okay, so who, who and where are my resources that are gonna help and assist me manage this? And I think we've done that. We've seen people do that very, very well. Um, but that's, that's another thing to, to not get stuck in the anxiety of what if, but go ahead and sort of work through the worst case that you can imagine and then start answering the questions so that you'll, a person will know, you'll know what that plan is. And also, um, uh, have a backup plan and a backup plan to that. Because as we've seen before, I mean, things are changing. People have asked me at work, hey, can you meet in about 15 minutes? And sometimes my honest answer is I have no idea because 15 minutes may be bringing something different. Um, and so being very, very flexible is important. Right, in an effort to, I'm gonna tie a few things up because it's time for us to be out of our time. Um, I've got three other points I wanna make. Choose your news carefully. If you are someone who watches the news all the time, it's always on in the background, you're watching 15 different sources, my advice is stop it. It is not healthy for you. It generates much, much more anxiety than it would be if you can, if you can control it better. Set aside a time that you wanna get current and then leave it alone. Pick a reputable source. For example, um, the CDC is a great place to get objective information, most current, about what the situation is with COVID-19. Um, getting on social media is a great way to stay connected to people and to laugh and to get some interesting things. It is a terrible place to get your news. There's all kinds of stuff out there. Some of it is really out there and not helpful and just generates more anxiety. The second thing is I encourage people, try not to judge others. It's easy to say, oh, this person's overreacting. This person is being ridiculous. You don't know what someone else has been through. You don't know if someone's had someone in their family who's got the, 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 the virus. You don't know if they've had some kind of personal crisis. You don't know if they have mental health issues. Our ability to be supportive and tolerant of each other during this very stressful and difficult time goes a long way towards everyone reaching out and helping each other. And the last thing is stay connected. Isolation generates more stress for people than almost anything. Make time for your families. Do what we're doing here, but with family members. We've actually, um, we scheduled a, a family meeting with people from all over the country recently. That was a lot of fun. And I think on Thursday night, we're having a, uh, a happy hour, whatever that means. But that should be fun with the different members of my family. So get, get together with people, stay connected and stay in touch. That goes a long way towards helping. Brian, your last thoughts? Yeah, I, I like your idea of the, the family happy hour by Zoom. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, to, to throw some creativity out, having virtual stars is where we, we zoom in on our phones, go outside and, and spot satellites or look at the things in the night sky we love to look at together. We're still doing it together. We're just doing it in a safer way. Um, one thing that, that struck me last week, and I kind of keep it in my, in my mind, as a, as a kind of a soothing thought is, 
you know, we are one day closer to this being over. Um, and we're also taking great steps and strides in innovation, developing new concepts and new normals in the way we do business. The healthcare world is changing dramatically and rapidly, as are many other parts of our, our economy, um, to find ways to deliver services in, in new and creative ways. But we are indeed one, one, day, one day closer to this being over uh, in a way that we can return to some sort of normal. And um, so, you know, name of the game, manage your stress, help your employees manage their stress, uh, set a good example, communicate well and often and honestly, and when you don't know, the best answer is, I don't know, right. um, and that's right. honesty. So I, th I think we have some uh, Q and A time. Is that right, Jennifer? Yes, it is. We are ready for questions and answers, and we have received some really great questions. Um, first of all, just want to say thank you to each of you for um, sharing such great um, tips for us today. It is important that we take care of ourselves first. I really like that if you can name it, you can tame it, Dr. Endenbaum. And uh, I definitely um, want to make sure I have plenty of chocolate. That's a must for me. So, um, and staying connected is, is also really important. And we've tried to keep things structured in our home as well so that everybody can, can accomplish what they need to do. Um, so our first question today is, how do you know if an employee is totally stressed out and at the point of doing harm to themselves or to others? And what do you do in that situation? Well, obviously this is a problem right now because people are under, are under even more stress, but it's an issue that employers have to consider and think about all the time. And I think the thing that we always look for is someone who has, is suddenly doing things differently than they've ever done them before. When you've got someone who has always been a pretty dependable or okay person and suddenly they're losing their temper, they're not focused, they seem sad, um, they're talking about things in ways that don't make sense. Um, those are all really warning signs of something that ne really needs to be attended to. Brian? Yeah, I, I think there, there are two categories of, of things that we might see. One is when you see an employee who's, who's more tearful or, or seemingly more emotionally um, distressed, that's obvious. That's, that's where you want to uh, gently inquire. Um, we've, we've got also, we, ha we also have the the concern of keeping boundaries because you know you do what you do very well um and, and we do what we do well and that is that we provide mental health services um we don't make furniture we don't provide other forms of health care and so when you see employee behavior that's out of the ordinary um the, the question is where can you where can you connect them to get some assistance um employees who's um as I mentioned earlier, anger is kind of over over boiling. Or if they're making statements, you know, there there are a number of statements that folks can make, which are sort of uh, direct. I don't know if I can do this anymore. I don't know if I can make it through another week. Indirect, like that. Uh, direct. I think you know, uh, I've had enough. I don't know if I can go on. Um, and so connecting them with resources is very important. And and the other category is when a person's behavior is so unusual that it's very very obvious. Um, if a person is 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 doing uh, things that are completely out of character, then connecting with them with assistance immediately can be very helpful. I want to share a phone number, and this is our um, local mobile crisis unit um, for um, Catawba and, and surrounding counties. And these folks are from uh, Partners Behavioral Health, and they will actually send a clinician wherever a person is if there's a need um, for an assessment. And that number is 888-5-4673, um, So that, that's a quick way for anybody to receive assistance where they are. It doesn't require going to a, a hospital emergency room or having an EAP to, to, uh, to connect people with directly. So if you have an EAP, that's also, you can, I know in, in our in our work as an EAP, you can pick up the phone and call us and we'll help you brainstorm it. And perhaps if you have an EAP, my guess is they'd be willing to do that as well. Great. Thank you guys so much. Our next question is, what is the best way to help our employees who we know are stressed but are too proud to say so? How do we offer the encouragement that they need? 
Well, I, I think we sort of covered some of that about making sure you're taking time by managing, by wandering around, by giving good information, uh, by providing support and encouragement. But um, I, I also think that there's lots of other resources. For example, in the uh, we've uh, I, I believe you're going to make available to all the participants uh, an outline of everything that Brian and I discussed today. So you'll have that on that you can. Of resources, there are a number of websites and articles that we have identified as being really useful. So maybe those are some things that might be made available to employees. If an employee is complaining about difficulty dealing with a child who's anxious, there's a handout that information that can be given to them. If they're having a lot of trouble managing their anxiety and stress, in addition to pointing them in the right direction, you may actually be able to give them a website that they can go to where they can gather additional information. So that's, those are some possibilities, Brian. Yeah, I, I think that kind of path, we could call it maybe passive support is a really good thing. Uh, another is uh, making sure that, that they have access to the, um, the ways to, to reach their, your EAP and other support. But also remember, uh, although folks may not obviously acknowledge that they're connecting with support, they may be doing that through their, their pastors, their church, um, they may be doing it um, through other resources they have in their community. Um, and I think a combination of information, as Gary had mentioned, uh, that we can provide folks um, in addition to those uh, connections to formal support with respect for the fact that they may be seeking informal support behind the scenes is, is also very, very good uh, to keep in mind. I would add one more thought, and that's that it's important for all of, listen, we're all in this together. We're, we're all scared, we're all frightened, we're all worried, we're all stressed. I think when people are willing to acknowledge that to each other, when you're working with people and you say, hey, how you doing, man? It's been tough for me, how are you? I, I don't know about most people that I know of who work in wherever they work, they develop another family. We have our work families, people who care about us and who we care about. And the more that we're, reaching out to each other and letting people know that we care about each other, the more likely is that someone who's vulnerable or needy might be more willing to be forthcoming and share and maybe get the help that they need. Sure, great advice. Well, I think something that's on everybody's mind and we've received a question about this is, um, what do the worries or issues look like when we trans transition back to normal? Um, some people are fearful about the mandate to return to work and is their family going to be safe? And what about their children when they go back to school? How would you um, address those concerns and fears? Well, I, I, my first thought, and then I, I talk fast because if I don't talk first, then I never get to talk. <laughs> Brian's very verbal. Hi, Brian. Anyhow, <laughs> what I was going to say is remember what we talked about earlier, which is ste stepping back from that and asking yourself, what can I control? What can't I control? And when there are things that you think you can control, then sit down and think through, well, what can I do about that? And what's my plan? But my guess is a lot of the things that people are anxious about are things we just don't know. You can't control if you don't know. So it's about trying to at least set that up in your head so you recognize you're not banging your head against the wall, trying to fix things that right now aren't nameable or aren't controllable. That's my first thought, Brian. Yeah, it's an interesting challenge. So when folks are coming back to work, what anxieties might they bring? And 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 I think that goes back to uh, one of the suggestions we made earlier, which is to have an employee forum. So if to elicit those concerns from folks before they come back, then yeah. as an employer, can we address them? Um, I think one of the concerns we can anticipate is our spacing and distance in our workplaces. And I know there are a lot of things that we do to make things and provide services where we work very physically close together. So for the employee to know how that's being addressed before they come back, I think could, could be very uh, helpful. Another is there's a timing issue. So we have employees at home now with their children who are at home from school. What happens if you as an employer are ready to bring those employees back and their children are not going back to school? So having some ways to, to brainstorm with employees, to look at community resources, to help them with childcare, so that they know that they're looked at in a, a well and safe environment as they come back to work to be helpful. But I would go back to the idea of the forum, having an employee forum 
uh, where uh, those questions and concerns can be gathered and addressed now or, or in the ensuing weeks before we do have a callback order available. Great advice. Thank you guys so much. You guys have shared some really valuable information today that I hope will be very helpful to our business leaders who have joined us today. And we want to thank each of you who've joined us and also have several messages here to say thanks to you guys. Our speaker, our, our panel, our participants have been very uh, helped uh, a lot out, helped out a lot today by the things you shared. And we appreciate that. Um, Keith, I'm going to toss it back to you and let you close us out. Unless uh, Brian or Dr. Indenbaum, do either of you have anything else to add as we get ready to close out? Sure. Go for walks. Uh, be close with people who are even physically distant um, and uh, eat well. Remember the chocolate and, and have, you got to make time to have fun during this. You've got to make time to, to do the things that you enjoy doing because this is a long journey we're on. Um, and uh, uh, having fun, going for walks, taking care of yourself can help to kind of mitigate our own anxiety. Make us better leaders. It's an old uh, Chinese uh, pictogram for crisis and it could be interpreted two way you can either see that word as meaning danger or opportunity it's dangerous and this is a dangerous time it is an opportunity you have an opportunity to do all those things brian's talking about get on that exercise program learn a new game with your kids do things that you normally didn't have the time to do use this as the opportunity to do that with the understanding at some point we're going to transition back to a lot of the things that we've had before Everybody's still here. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me now, Jennifer? Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. Uh, first, let me apologize for the technical difficulties this morning. I first got started, and I think you could see me but not hear me. So I think I've hopefully corrected that now. Again, let me extend my appreciation to you both for the insightful comments, uh, words of wisdom that I think we can, as business leaders, always take to heart and reach out to our employees and provide support and assistance to them. So thank you for that. Um, as I said, my name is Keith Seip. I'm one of the directors for business and industry at uh, Catawba Valley Community College. And I just wanted to wrap up by saying thank you to our speakers, by, thank you, by saying thank you to our sponsors. Uh, this Catawba Valley Community College, working in conjunction with K64 and with the Chamber of Catawba County, helped to put all this together. And I, there's so many people that I want to thank, but the list is really, really long. So. Thanks to all of those folks that participated in putting this together. Trust me, it took us a while to kind of put it together. And, and uh, so I hope that uh, those participants really learned a lot and appreciate it. I do want to mention though, our next, this is the first of many of our uh, leader talks that we hope to have each Tuesday for the next several weeks at 1130 on Tuesdays. Uh, we hope to have additional leader talks that were continue to provide some information and, and assistance to you as business leaders as we work through this continuing uh, situation. Uh, our next uh, leader talk is on Tuesday, April the 21st at 1130. Uh, extending lifelines to our employees is the subject of our next leader talk. We have four excellent speakers from, from the community that are gonna provide some key information where you can get emergency assistance support and support for your employees. Wendy Johnson, Director of Workforce Development with the Western Piedmont Council is gonna be here. Dr. Kathy Wood, the Executive Director of the Greater Hickory Cooperative Christian Ministries is gonna be here. Reverend Bob Silver, the Executive Director of the Eastern Catawba Cooperative Christian Ministries, that's a mouthful, is gonna be here as well. And then finally, Jenny Connor, the Executive Director of the United Way is gonna be here. So I hope that one, you found our first uh, leader talk helpful, insightful, uh, words of wisdom that I know I certainly will take to heart. Um, and, but I hope you also stay tuned next Tuesday and subsequent Tuesdays if we continue to bring these to you. Uh, we will have this uh, WebEx out on our websites. We'll download it on our websites. We'll also be sending out some information, key points, from Dr. Endenbaum and from Brian Hissom that they went over with you today. We'll send that, that out uh, in a PDF to all participants. And then we'll also be sending out invitations for the, our next uh, leader talk, Extending Lifelines to Your Employees. We hope to see you again next Tuesday at 1130. With that, that's all of my comments. Uh, any last words of 
wisdom before we sign off? Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. I think that concludes our, our event. Thank you.